hours ago the world premiere of Paul Thomas Anderson's Inherent Vice occurred, and our own Dean Treadway was there, and here he is. Hey, Dean. Hey, how's it going? Well, good, good. It's been, <laughs> it's, it's been seen for the first time, so um, let me just set the stage for you. First of all, I'm outside, not too far away from the theater, the Walter Reed Theater, where it'll be showing this afternoon and for the first public screenings and also in Alice Tully, I think, uh, in a bigger auditorium than Walter Reed and so forth. So, uh, I, you know, uh, but uh, it's nice and sunny out here uh, right now, uh, but uh, no, this was not the case this morning. Uh, I got up at about 6.45 this morning and headed down to the uh, theater and the line was already, already by the time an hour later, our line was, you know, just, you know, about 50 people or less than that, maybe less, you know. So, uh, and I asked the first person in line, by the way, like, how long you been standing here? And it was like 6, 6 15 a.m. Uh, and it, it was like miserable out, like absolutely fucking miserable. <laughs> so, and, uh, uh, you know, so, um, so I, I just sort of had to like find, I don't like carrying an umbrella in the city or whatever. So I just had to find shelter where I could and save my place in line. And I was talking to Tony Dayu, who comes up uh, from Atlanta uh, covering the festival for uh, a cinema viewfinder, his, uh, his site, and uh and just uh you know uh just generally like trying to stave off the cold and the wet but um but uh yeah so they let us in and uh at about 9:30 or maybe 9:15 or something and uh it's pretty it was pretty much a madhouse inside i mean like much much crazier than it's been for almost anything else that that's i've well definitely anything else that i've seen here um Okay, so uh, I've set the stage and told you where I'm at, so now we'll just talk about the movie. Um, well, thank God for that. Yes, yes, <laughs> finally, finally. I've, uh, I've done, uh, yes. Okay, so Inherent Vice. Okay, well, if you're a Paul Thomas Anderson uh, uh, fan, uh, and even possibly if you're not, uh, you're going to love it. It is uh, totally of a piece of his, like, incredible body of work. It's his seventh movie. And uh, for me, uh, I just adored it uh, from top to bottom. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly enough, uh, well, just to tell you what it's about, just to set up, really, and that's it. Uh, no, no further details. <clears throat> well, a few, but uh, the setup is basically in the first scene. Uh, Joaquin Phoenix is is getting stoned in his in his apartment. He runs a, a private eye investigation service, and uh, and he's visited by his uh, his ex girlfriend, uh, played really amazingly well by uh, Catherine Watterson. She's just uh, great in it. Um, uh, she comes to him and and says that she wants him to investigate. Um, her, she's going out with a billionaire land developer, um, and, um, and and you know they're it's her current boyfriend. You know she's working at a strip club and stuff, and and um, he's disappeared, and she and she wants him to investigate this. You know, and uh, the the film is narrated. It's narrated by um, uh, Joanna Newsom, who plays a character in the film uh, uh, that, that you'll find out about when he you know, watch the film, of course, but she, it's narrated, and so a lot of the uh, the narration really comes directly from Pinchon, Thomas Pinchon's book. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, let me ask you a question. The way, Joanna sure. Newsom, is he the narrator in the trailer, too? Is that the same? Yes, yes, in the trailer. Yes, that's that, great. Yeah, her yeah. voice, her voice yeah. just fits perfectly it's, with the, the tone of the novel and everything, so it's, it's just like... It's a, it's like a, almost a chirpy, but also kind of a serious voice, like at yeah. the same time. So it's like it's got both of those things going on at the same time, which is which is really nice. It's not overly narrated, by the way. It's got it's got uh, it, it knows exactly where to put the narration in, but not not put enough in to uh, to like 
uh, irritate you. Like, look, you don't need to tell us this or whatever. The right, narration right, right. just gives gives you a gives you a real pure sense of what the book's voice is, is like. So uh, you so you really for this, yeah. I think at times because the book, even though it's his most success, accessible book, and I have to put that in quotes. It's still uh-huh. not an easy read. He is not an easy read. Um, it's very. It took me three tries to get into over like a yeah, three-year period. Yeah, I mean, some period. people have like haven't some people like um, sort of like characterized this as like pinch on light or something like that. It, or, yeah, uh, but, uh, it, but that's still not an easy <laughs> easy uh-huh. read. He is hard to read. It is very hard to get into. But it's still of those. I have of everything I've tried. It is good. And if, that, if you've never read anything by him before, this is the one to go to gravitate towards. I mean, give it a mm-hmm. shot. Okay. Well, uh, so it does capture the voice of the book quite well. And, um, and as we get deeper into uh, the investigation, uh, it gets obviously more complicated uh, to the point where uh, it uh, – it actually sort of recalls, and in fact, I asked Paul Thomas Anderson if he had screened this movie before. Uh, that was one of the questions that I asked. Uh, uh, but uh, it actually recalls uh, sort of like, and of course, the set, it was set in the 70s, and, and, uh, and, you know, Joaquin Phoenix is a dope smoker, you know, California dope smoker. So, uh, but uh, it actually, uh, it's, it actually resembles uh, another, you know, uh, another sort of noir uh, investigatory film, uh, Howard Hawks' The Big Sleep, in the sense that <clears throat> it actually gets so confusing at times, and I say this in the best way possible, by the way, uh, and, and I say this for the viewers to understand that this is intentional, uh, but uh, and and uh, sort of like take joy in the confusion of it all. Like, that's what I would say. Because when you watch The Big Sleep, after a while, you don't even care about the mystery anymore. You just can't, you're just interested in following, you know, Bogart as he invest as he encounters all of these all these various characters uh, to to ask them questions to get him closer to to solving the mystery. And so that's. That's what this is, you know. It's, it, it becomes very, very convoluted, and I imagine. I, I mean, I, I'm, I, I know that there have been some reactions in the audience uh, from some people, including one guy that I'll tell you a little story about later. It was sitting close to us. That he, that they, they didn't know what was going on in it, basically. But it's not about like figuring out this mystery i mean it is i mean and eventually by the time the movie gets to where it's going y- you are able to connect the dots in it and figure it out uh, right. but, uh, and get uh, get some of the nuances in the first go at it you know <clears throat> uh but uh it's a uh, it's a movie about uh, the journey and, and and it's uh okay so the the trailer is trying to make it look like a little bit of a raucous comedy, and and it is in the first uh, hour and a half. And it does take a turn, though. It does take a turn where it gets a lot more serious. So Mm -hmm. I would not say, I mean, you know, people are going to say Big Lebowski. uh, You know, they're going to say, oh, you know. And it does resemble Big Lebowski in terms of, you know, uh, the intentions of its character, the uh, you know its its main character and and uh, and some of the characteristics of its main character, but it's not it's not as like wildly crazy as that. I mean, it's crazy, right. but it's not like it doesn't just have that same tone, really. You know, right, right. So, um, so uh, you know, like some of the Pratt Folly stuff that you see in the uh, see in the trailer and stuff like that. That's about all of that that you're gonna get. Like that's so just to let you know, okay? Okay. Um, all right, no, that's good to know. <laughs> uh so but um uh that said there's a lot of huge laughs in it and a lot of the laughs come from the language and the dialogue and uh and the sort of crazy kind of like I told Paul Thomas Anderson does a really fun thing in it where <clears throat> you he kind of puts you in his head in a little way. It's like <clears throat> there's a great moment, I'm not giving anything away here, but there's a great moment where uh, Joaquin Phoenix, uh, Jenna Malone uh, is in it, and she shows him a 
a picture of their child, which is a very sweet child. You see the child later on in in the, in the movie, and very very beautiful child that she's had with the a character played by uh, Owen Wilson, and uh, uh, somehow for some reason, when Joaquin Phoenix's uh, character Doc Sportello, uh, when he looks at the picture of the child, he looks at it real quick, and then he goes ah. And then, like, gives the picture back. And you're like, what? Uh, but that was weird. Like, this is great. Did he really do that, or is that just in his head? So that just gives you sort of an idea. That's just a little thing that uh, the movie really tries to, especially in the first part, in that sort of foggy kind of way that it does the detective story. Well, the character's in a fog of pot smoke anyway, so <laughs> he's not really to really able to really uh, put two and two together in the case either. So that's, that's why it's confusing. And when he starts to clear up a little bit, the, the, the mystery starts to clear up in the movie too. So that's, that's kind of a brilliant wonderful thing that uh P. T. Anderson does in it. Uh I uh I have to I have to say I have to go to some of the cast here that is just an unbelievable cast. You never know who's gonna pop up in it. Um I'm not going to go through it all, but um I will say that the other I mean like Phoenix is of course amazing in it. I mean amazingly focused and and hilarious and his reactions to the things that he's <laughs> that he's the clues that he's discovering and stuff and and uh and everything in the film are just brilliantly wonderful, you know, like just just great. I mean like a I, I mean just as good as he was in the master, but in a different way, you know, of course. So, I mean, like, another, to me, it's further proof that he's, like, one of the great actors now. I mean, like, just absolutely one of the greats. And I hope that this is kind of like, if P.T. Anderson does his next movie with uh, Joaquin Phoenix, I'll tell you, it will be, like, one of the great, it will, like, graduate into one of those great, Actor director pairings, you know that you know like Scorsese and De Niro, you know. I mean, it's already well on its way with just those two, these two movies. So, uh, but the other huge, huge star in it um, is uh, Josh Brolin, who plays a uh, L.A. detective uh, uh, who they, who they know as Bigfoot, who uh, went to school actually with uh, Phoenix's character Doc, and. Uh, and they, so they have a little bit of a past together, and um, they kind of start um, start you know their own investigations of of th- this uh, case, and then there, there becomes other sides to this case that that pop up, um, including of course uh, uh, Sasha. I mean, uh, yes, uh, Sasha Faye's. Uh, character, you know, uh, uh, Catherine Waterston, she disappears. This happens after the first scene, basically. Uh, she disappears, and so that becomes uh, 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 Phoenix's motivation for, uh, real true motivation for figuring things out because he's still in love with her. So, uh, and, but Brolin's performance <laughs> is ridiculously funny. I mean, outstandingly funny, like over the top. You know, he's he's a, he also he's also like a character that uh, sort of like Kevin Spacey in in L.A. Confidential, where he he works as a he, he's he's got his SAG card and he he does extra work in in you know dragnet and stuff like that. So <laughs> it's like uh, you know uh, <laughs> he's just amazingly funny in it. And by the way, there's a hilarious. Uh, when Josh Brolin comes in, uh, your first time you see him, he's part of a commercial where he's wearing an afro and stuff. It's just, it's just the nuttiest performance, really. It's just so great, um, like absolutely superb. And and uh, also, I would say, you know, definitely J.K. Simmons has uh, in Whiplash has some uh, has some competition this year for the supporting actor Oscar. Um, uh, and uh, I would say that also that Catherine Catherine Washington really deserves uh, a supporting actress Oscar because uh, Oscar nomination at least, if not the award, because she she provides a, a ridiculous intensity 
to everything that she's in. Like, just like there is something about her eyes that just uh, draw you in, and you completely, absolutely understand why Joaquin Phoenix would would uh, go to uh, such lengths to uh, to discover what happened to her, even if. Even if, as we say, it doesn't, you know, even if it's, you know, the the future of the relationship is in question. So, I mean, she's just amazingly, amazingly uh, uh, spellbinding in it. Um, but I want to point out too that um, that uh, Martin Short has a wonderful, you know, everybody in it, you know, has like just a few scenes in it. I mean, in the in the press conference afterwards, you know, they were talking about how how uh, some some were saying how loose uh, that uh, Paul Thomas Anderson works, and then some were saying, well, with uh, particularly with Joanna Newsom, who is the narrator, she said that she didn't actually work loose because she actually had to she had to follow the pinch on the pinch on words more closely than anybody else did because of the narration. So, uh, but uh, most most everybody uh, in it only has like one or two scenes and and probably only got the pages that they were in. You know, in the I'm not sure about that, but I have I get the sense that uh, that uh, they you know. They just got those pages to work with, and then maybe they really, unless they read the book, maybe they really didn't know exactly what was going to happen. And by the way, not everybody had read the book on stage, you know. So, um, but Martin Short is uh, is absolutely great in it. Um, Martin Donovan pops up in it in probably my favorite scene in the movie. I won't tell you anything about what these characters do. Um but uh, uh, Jeannie Berlin is hilarious in it, uh, in her one scene, uh, the, the great Jeannie Berlin, uh, Lane May's daughter. Um, uh, you know, uh, Reese Witherspoon is very strong in it. Um, Jenna Malone. I mean, everybody has their moment in it. And uh, and it's just quite, quite wonderful. I mean, I... I, I I mean, I just dug it. It's like one of my favorite movies of the year. It's beautifully shot again. Uh, uh, unfortunately, we didn't get to see the 35 millimeter print. They're showing a 35 millimeter print at Alice Telly tonight. So I, I, we were thinking, oh, we're going to see the 35. But uh, Paul Thomas Anderson said, well, I feel like a little bit of a fraud because this wasn't the 35 millimeter print. This was the DCP, and um, and so uh, so. I was actually, I was actually fooled. It looked pretty, it looked pretty fucking good. And I thought, hey man, you can see the grain on it and everything. It's pretty good. Uh, the, but uh, the uh, the photography is done, of course, by Robert Ellswit, who does all of Paul Thomas Anderson's movies. And and you know, again, like really, really wonderful photography that does that does. Uh, it's in uh, it's in one eight five. By the way, it's not a scope movie. Um, so it it does uh, it does recall like something like the long goodbye. I mean, uh, you know, or something like that. I mean, that's probably another movie that they screened a lot uh, before uh, before making this film. I was, thinking that. Film. I was yeah. thinking that would be the uh, that would be the one I would go to uh, first, and then maybe the Big Sleep. But definitely, the long goodbyes is such an influential. You can't help but I mean, even something like Greenberg has like references to the long goodbye. So I mean, right, and right. So yeah. and, and I and I did not know Glenn Kenny was the one who pointed that out. Not me. I'm just saying though. But there are certain elements in that. I mean, long goodbyes is one of the great, great, and that's another LA film where you really movie. don't yeah. care. You don't really care who did it. You just want to fall. And that's I think true of all great detective stories. You like it's the I detective. think you're right. It's the detective mm-hmm. that you really, you don't, you know, it's like with like someone like um, Travis McGee, John McDonald's character. You don't care um, about the mystery so much. They're such intriguing characters. Even something recently like True Detective, they're such intriguing characters. You really don't care about what's going on. Uh, you yeah, know. all of the mystery is, the mystery is, <laughs> the mystery is secondary to, yeah. it's secondary to hanging out with these guys. So, I mean, so, uh, you know. Uh, well, let me say this. Let me say this, because actually, okay. from, when when they first started shooting, uh, uh, P.T. Anderson was talking about the long goodbye. Uh, so, I mean, that's definitely a fixture of this movie. But a yeah. lot of people are saying when they see the movie, um, 
it it what the movie really seems to be saying beyond its plot and and characters and everything is that uh, P.T. Anderson really misses when movies used to be like this. Mm -hmm. Movies used to feel like this. Mm -hmm. Uh, Uh So do you you, you feel like a loving nostalgia for those kind of ambling 70s movies? Absolutely. Absolutely. Like right down to like the quality of the... uh, of the dissolves in it, you know, like it gets that detailed, like the, you know, right, right down to like the little details, you know, uh, um, filmically, I mean, filmically, uh, not, yeah. not just, not just in terms of recreating the period and everything, which it does superbly as well. Um, but, uh, but just, just the way, the way the, the fades and the way the, the way the, the shot setups are and the, even the lenses that are, that are used and the decisions to go to close up at certain times and, uh, camera movements and stuff like that. Absolutely. And of course the use of music, which Johnny Greenwood does the score again, but, uh, but this is mostly a source music score, which is, uh, and it's, it's, uh, brilliantly put together um it, 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 and it doesn't just concentrate on 70s music it does 50s and 60s and 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 so forth so it really uh it's really it's actually a, a score uh, a, uh that you just when it's over you just go wow what an amazing score i just want to go and get this uh, get this soundtrack like i right, the soundtrack right. has three discs on it you know <laughs> you know and um and like in Magnolia, you know, where there's a lot of a lot of scenes where <clears throat> dialogue scenes where the music is just pulsating away in the background or whatever, mm-hmm. like just continually, 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 no matter if they change location or whatever, that happens here too, you know. So again, like kind of a Paul Thomas Anderson kind of hallmark that you know fans of his movies love. Um, uh, now let me just say this: when <clears throat> when the movie was over, I was sitting right next to somebody who loved it, you know, like I did, and we talked about like right before the movie started, like whether we were just so excited that maybe we had lost all perspective and everything. And uh, I don't think that that's the case. Uh, I mean, that, yes, it was very exciting, and and there were there was a shitload of people there, and and it's pretty crazy. I mean, like principals of the of the movie uh, up there on stage afterwards, but uh, and 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 just a lot of hoo ha, and we're sitting standing in line for three hours for it, and we're just all pumped up, no question about it. However, that said, I have. Also, you know, I have reacted badly to movies sometimes. I mean, it's easy to be disappointed with a movie, you know. I can I well, yeah. you know, I don't I don't work like that where, I, you know, I I just get so pumped up that I, you know, I have before. I've done it before. I I've, I've talked about it on the show with something like Batman back in 89. And right. uh, I've learned I I learned from that experience, you know, that don't get so pumped up that you, you know, lose all lose all sense of, you know, whether uh whether a thing is worth it or not. But uh but when it was over and everything, uh <clears throat> I t- turned to my you know, the person sitting next to me and I said, uh say, oh, this was fun, what uh, yeah, totally. Oh yeah, yeah, totally. And then the other and we sit with another guy like sitting right next to him. I, I don't remember these people's names by the way, but uh the other guy next to him said, uh, I have no idea what I just watched and uh i said uh what do you mean he said well it had no story it had no it had no general thrust to it or whatever i say wow i completely disagree i absolutely disagree he said oh well you were just gonna like it anyway and i said no nah, you don't know me <laughs> you don't know me and uh, and then I just left it alone because I was going to get into a fight. You know? <laughs> and I didn't want to get into a fight, so I just said, "Okay, well, we'll just agree to disagree or whatever." And um, and then uh, he got this guy, the bitter guy, got up and walked out to I guess go to the restroom or something. Uh, there was a little gap in between the movie and the press conference, and we were asked to all sit in our seats. He got up, went to the restroom, and guy next to me said. You know what happened, don't you? I said, "Why?" He said, "He fell asleep during it." And I said, "Because hey, he he saw him sleeping." 
And I said, oh, well, that's a pretty that's shitty it. thing. I mean, just yeah. just say you, fall, you fell asleep, dude. Like, don't. I mean, I know there's pressure, you know, to, I mean, maybe there's some kind of pressure on the guy to, like, to, he's got, he can't say that he fell asleep during it. And so he's got to. He's got to go back to his outlet or whatever he's doing it this for and go back and say, yeah, I saw it. I I hated it or whatever. It's like, but tell the truth, man. You fell asleep in it. That's why you didn't get the story. Don't blame it all on the movie. I mean, you might have fallen asleep, too, because you had to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning in order to even get here. So, I mean, like, don't blame all this shit on the movie. Why? Yeah, no, no, I mean, that's understandable. I mean, I would have just been very honest and I fell asleep, you know, I, it was very early and I'd try to go see it again at a late, you know, to get, yeah. you know, to get, I, I would, if it was me and I, and I had fallen asleep, although I died, I would have had so, so much caffeine before the yeah. to make sure I didn't fall asleep. I had three monsters. I had three yeah. monster energy drinks and, 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 a, and a coffee. <laughs> so, I mean, like, just to, just to do this, because last night I only got four hours of sleep. But just to do this, I, I, you know, so, I mean, like, you know, who knows? Maybe all that caffeine made me like, oh, this is great, or whatever, but I don't think so. I, I you know, and I, I won't lie, I am predisposed to like the Paul, the Paul Thomas Anderson movies, you know? Oh, yeah, I, I think all three of us are. I think we all yeah, have three of us are. But he does good movies. I mean, like, yeah. he... he he has, he's done nothing but good movies. So, I mean, so it's... But okay, so tell, us, even, tell us about the press conference. Yeah, yeah. Okay, the press, the press conference. Well, I had something to say, so I did it. I've been, as I said in the last show, I have been standing up at the press conference and asking questions, and, well, they asked us to stand up at this one. Sometimes I don't stand up, but I have been announcing myself as Dean Treadway, Movie Geeks United, and I asked a question. I'm very direct. And my question was about whether uh, Paul Thomas Anderson had uh, screened uh, The Big Sleep beforehand, but... uh, The major part of the question, or the other part of the question was, my second part was, okay, so I started to lose it here a little bit, you know, started to get my little crying voice on, which is honest, you know, but um, uh, I, uh, uh, hold on just a second, I got some people coming up, I'm I'm recording something here, so, um, uh, so it's like, uh, mid- it's like Midnight Cowboy. I recorded something here. I recorded. It. <laughs> <laughs> well, so uh, uh, I said, okay. First part of the question, Mr. Anderson. I like. I love the movie. Then I asked him about the uh, about the big sleep, uh, which he confirmed that was a movie. That, but second part, I got a little cryy, and I said, okay. So I just have to do this, uh, Mr. Short. Um, I have been a fan of yours ever since I was like 11 years old, 10 years old, uh, staying up, uh, to, uh, maybe, maybe 13, staying up two o'clock in the morning, every Friday night to watch SCTV network 90. And I want to tell you in this movie, you shine like a diamond, um, and in everything you do, uh, you shine like a diamond. I, I just want to profess my unending love for you. And uh, everybody on the stage and in the audience applauded. Wow. Wow. Um, wow. And, Good um, moment. <laughs> and totally applauded. And he just gave me a really great eye-to-eye contact. I was in the third row. Um so just great eye to eye contact and and uh later on on Facebook Tony Dayu uh will be posting uh a picture that I took with Martin Shirt um uh after the after the spreading. Oh, uh, but um uh my one like geeky fan moment uh uh well one of three. Uh the other geeky fan moment that I had was after the press conference was over I brought up my Magnolia poster, my rolled Magnolia poster. And I said, uh, back in Atlanta, I said, you know, I had bought a uh, a Mike Lee poster for Life is Sweet. You know, I laid out some money for that. And, and I said, well, I'm going to bring this up. That's definite. 
But uh, then at the last minute I said, you know what, I'll fucking kick myself if I don't uh, bring up a Magnolia poster because what if the guy is standing right there in front of me? I mean, like, it's crazy. I, I won't be able to forgive myself if I don't bring it up. So uh, I just jockeyed right on up there, and the last thing he did while he was on stage, you know, he was very gracious. Uh, and I'll talk about that uh, in a minute. But uh, the last thing he did was uh, he said, oh, I, I can't spend too much time. How about if I just do it here? I said, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I totally get it. And he signed my Magnolia poster. So, and then everybody was like, man, that's a fucking treasure. Yeah. I was like, yep, <laughs> it sure is. Um, uh you know, I was told beforehand, they said, you know what, they're not, uh, I was warned, he's not going to do it, but that he was, I don't know, I just got the impression from what people were saying that they they had some kind of idea that he was a sullen or maybe not very open kind of person, um, and uh, absolutely not the case, not the case. This guy is definitely a movie lover, a movie geek. I mean, he was up there totally eating up the movie geeky questions, like why did you shoot this in this format and stuff. And he was like, all right, technical question, awesome, and stuff like that. So he was totally – and he he sat up there and said, I could talk about this kind of stuff, like, for hours, you know, like these kind of questions. This is what – I like, you know, and uh, so he totally struck me as somebody that absolutely would, well, he would love our show, for instance, you know, he would just, he would just totally dig it, uh, and he, uh, you know, looked like a great guy to go and hang out with, and just talk movies, and just totally, uh, was totally, you know, um, you know, yes, absolutely creative, but also absolutely, uh, absolutely open, and uh, and and that's probably why his cast is it was completely devoted to him, and uh, uh, and so that was my impression of Paul Thomas Anderson. By the way, uh, the New York Film Festival uh, records a lot of these things, and in fact, I've seen them posted on YouTube. So if you I think if you want to go and see the uh, press conference, I think it's out there, out there to be seen. You know, they don't just record it for you know to put in an well, archive or something. There are it's pictures there. on Tumblr. Uh, there was uh, a couple of hours ago. There was a picture on Tumblr of Paul Thomas Anderson from the press conference. So I uh, saw that earlier. Okay. So I mean, there are a lot of pictures on Tumblr, as far as I know. Um, okay. Okay, so we move over to Joaquin Phoenix. Okay, okay, so who was there? Okay, so it was Joaquin Phoenix, and for this I have to look at the press book. They they were nice enough to give us a press book, uh, by the way. That's very very nice and would uh, would look good with a lot of autographs on it. But I didn't get any autographs except for Paul Thomas Anderson. Uh, but. Um, so up there was uh, Owen Wilson, uh, Joaquin Phoenix, Owen Wilson, Catherine Waterston, Jenna Malone, um, Benicio Del Toro, Maya Rudolph, uh, Martin Short, Hong Chow, she's great in it. Uh, lots of new faces in it uh, that, that I really didn't know. Um, uh, no, uh, Sacha P- uh, Petiers, um uh, boy, I'm going to keep some of this stuff under under my hat. <laughs> I don't want to say. Yeah, no, I think please, please do because I think you're. I think there are some. I mean, I didn't know about Martin Donovan, so don't. Um, right. Yeah. I'm not going to say some of these. No, no, no uh, one Michael else. Kenneth, don't mention anyone else. Michael Michael Co- Kenneth Williams. Uh, uh, you know Omar on the wire. Uh, mm-hmm. um, he he's in it, and he was there at the press conference as well. Uh, Reese Witherspoon was supposed to be here, but she didn't actually make it. And also Joanna Newsom, who is, the, of course, the narrator. So, uh, so they're all. I mean, it's a lot of people up there. I mean, it's a ridiculous yeah, amount. Yeah, that hours. is. That is uh, absolutely ridiculous. Uh, uh, and uh, to see them all up there, and and Martin Short was, of course, funny. Uh, you know, and he was. Uh, you know, at first, uh, you know, like, it felt like there were so many people up there that it was difficult to, to get to hear from them all. Um, but, uh, uh, like, a, a, 
you know, uh, eventually, you know, a lot of people were centering in on uh, asking Paul Thomas question, uh, Paul Thomas Anderson the questions. Uh, but um, then, uh, then it kind of broke out into uh, asking how you know Owen Wilson got into the role, uh, got into uh, the '70s sort of vibe, you know, of the movie. Um, this was a question asked by the moderator, Kent Jones, who's running the festival, uh, or one of the people running it, the programmer. Um, and uh, you know, so so it, it kind of broke out from there. But it started also like where where Martin Short started, you know, didn't take over things, you know, but just you know put in those little bits of humor that he's so great at and uh and so uh make us love him so much and uh and uh um, then uh later on it went it somebody asked a very cogent question about you know that went out to the entire cast that just really just asked them you know how they approached their roles like one by one each one of them talked and and talked about how they got into the roles and what their what their um what their, you know, methods and what their relationship with P.T. Anderson was. However, all that said, the only person who said almost zero, nothing, was, uh, was, um, Joaquin Phoenix. Isn't that surprise me? <laughs> <laughs> that, no, it doesn't surprise me at all. It was like, I was turning to my friend over here next to me, and I was like, yeah, he hates this stuff, you know, he just hates it. So, um, although apparently he was a little bit, uh, a little bit more open last year when her was here, uh, but uh, he just was not saying anything. And when he, when, they they started at Martin Short. Martin Short was at the end of the line, uh, and then and then it went down the line. The the uh, microphone went down the line, and then there was Joaquin Phoenix, and then P. P. Anderson, and then the moderator. So and then when it got to uh, Phoenix, and this was this was almost the last question. He just he said, "Ah, eh, no," and and that was it. I was like, "Come on."